Okay, if I could have everyone's uh, attention, please. That would be great. Let's try that again. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so welcome to another installment of the Ethics Law and Society Forum. Uh, our guest this week, I'm very uh, excited to introduce, Ian Haney Lopez is uh, one of our foremost thinkers on race, racism, law, identity, integration uh, in America today. Um, his most recent book, yeah, here, Dog Whistle Politics, let me make sure I get this right, it's up there, How Coded Racial Appeals Have Reinvented Racism and Wrecked the Middle Class, um, explores an argument suggesting that um, that uh, conservative politicians have uh, exploited racial tropes to further an agenda that, uh, and policies that favor the rich. Um, he is currently the uh, John H. Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. So those of you in pre-law, perk up. Um, uh, he's also taught in the past at Yale, NYU, Harvard. Um, in the case of those credentials aren't enough, uh, he, his Harvard Law degree is also matched by a master's in public policy from Princeton and a uh, master's in history from Washington University. Um, on a personal note, let me just add that his work has not only been influential across academia generally, but also right here with, uh, right here at SSU. Um, my own work um, has been influenced tremendously. If you've heard me talk about race in some of my classes, you'll have heard me talk about how the law has struggled to conceptualize race in a meaningful, coherent way, and that's in, been influenced in part by his earlier book, White by Law, um, and um, uh, some of his work on Latino identity has been a, uh, provided a premise for me um, in arguing against the new biology of race. So there's a lot of connections here to be drawn. Uh, so it's a real privilege for me to introduce not only a widely renowned uh, thinker on race, racism, and law, but also somebody who uh, has influenced me personally. So please join me in welcoming Ian Haney Lopez to Sonoma State. Uh, thanks, Josh, for that welcome, and thank you all of you um, for, for being here. So um, to try and bring this, uh, to try and bring this into a more sort of immediate context, you understand that California spends about a billion dollars per year more on prisons than on higher education. Why is that? When did that start? Right? That, that, that shift started about 1980. Why? Why do we spend so much more on prisons than on public education? And I asked that question as a way of getting your attention. Something dramatic has happened in our country over the last 50 years in terms of a turning away from government as something that can help the middle class and a hijacking of government in terms of punishing the poor, uh, for example, by cutting off access to education, but also by building more prisons. Why and how did that happen? I want to tell this story. Um, I think the, the, the larger answer is a sort of a culture war politics that has gripped the nation for 50 years. Uh, first, among e first among equals is race. So the story I'm going to tell is a story of what I call dog whistle politics. Dog whistle politics, dog whistles, those are coded terms. A dog whistle, I mean, some of you probably used them. You blow them, humans can't hear them, but dogs can because they're at the right frequency, right, for dogs. So a dog whistle is, uh, you know, is speech that on its surface doesn't mention race, it's silent, but nevertheless it triggers strong racial reactions. Welfare queen, illegal alien, terrorist, thug, think about all of those words. They do not mention race, and yet those words have very strong racial resonances, right? Those are dog whistles. And what I'm going to argue is, it's not just that these racially coded terms are being used to create anxiety in the electorate. It's that they're associated with a particular ideology which is at war with government for all of us and instead has been harnessed to a project of government for the very rich. All right, so let me start this way. You probably know we are seeing levels of wealth inequality in this country we haven't seen in a hundred years. You probably know, um, or maybe you don't. Uh, median income in the United States is around fifty thousand. That's roughly a ten percent drop since the beginning of the Great Recession in two thousand eight. That's stagnated compared to where it was in nineteen seventy, right? And if it seems like median income has held steady since nineteen seventy. That's actually an illusion 
because what has happened since 1970 is many, many women have entered the workforce. And it's only because women have entered the workforce that family wages have stayed stable. Otherwise, median wages in the United States, median family income in the United States has been effectively dropping. Meanwhile, the rich are becoming more and more rich. The Walmart uh, family, there's six heirs to the Walmart fortune. They control $90 billion. That's as much wealth as 30% of all Americans combined. That is, there are six people in this country who hold as much wealth as roughly one third. Right? Or if you think about CEOs, in 1970 CEOs made roughly 40% what their average worker made. Now they make roughly 355 times what their average worker makes. In other words, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, he makes every day what his average worker makes in a year of labor. Right? Or uh, what about the hedge fund folks? A couple years ago, one hedge fund guy made $2.2 billion. Now that's a number that's so big, it's just mind-boggling. I don't, I don't get it. So I just started dividing it, right? So, okay, you divide it down, you divide it by 365. <laughs> He's making $6 million a day, Sundays included. Right? Well, how much is that? That's just under $100 a second. So if he takes out his bill fold and a $100 bill falls, and he leans down to pick it up, he's probably going to hesitate, is it worth his time or not? By the time he's back up, he's made $500. This is obscene. OK. Levels of wealth inequality we haven't seen in 100 years. A precarious middle class we haven't seen in 100 years. So what was happening 100 years ago? This is the age of the robber barons. This is the age in which sort of concentrated wealth had captured government. This was great for Wall Street. You had the Roaring Twenties, and then you had the Great Depression. And in the wake of the Great Depression, we realized as a country, government must serve everyone. It can't serve the very rich. And what does it mean to say government must serve everyone? It means government must provide a safety net for people who stumble either through illness or accident uh, or because of dislocation in the, in the workplace. Government must provide routes of upward mobility, like what? Free, excellent, high quality education, right? Escalators for upward mobility. What else should government provide? Government should provide access to credit for housing because housing property is one of the main ways in which people build wealth. What else? Infrastructure. Government needs to pool the resources of the whole society to build the infrastructure that sets the, the sort of, um, uh, uh, that lays the base for the next great economic expansion. Government has to regulate the marketplace. It has to make sure that the biggest corporations don't effectively achieve monopoly status so that there's real competition in the marketplace. And government should engage in progressive taxation. That is, the people who've amassed great fortunes, they should be taxed to support these projects. They should be taxed more than the poor. Note that uh, Mitt Romney was arguing for the reverse. Right? He was arguing that the poor should pay more in taxes than the rich. Right? That's a sort of a program for good government. That's what we call New Deal liberalism. And I'll use the phrase New Deal liberalism as a shorthand. That's the set of government interventions in our economy and in our culture that produce the greatest expansion of the middle class this country and the world have ever seen. And I want to be clear, New Deal liberalism was bipartisan. Yes, it was launched by FDR, but it was quickly picked up by a Republican Eisenhower. And when you think about one of the iconic New Deal programs, Social Security, that's Dwight Eisenhower. Right? So it was a bipartisan project. Nevertheless, there was always resistance to the idea that the government should help everybody rather than just the rich. And that resistance was articulated by this person in 1964, 50 years ago. This is Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater wins the Republican uh, nomination uh, for, uh, to campaign for president. Barry Goldwater, he's um, a scion of a wealthy retail family in Arizona, but I've got him up, but this is his, he's a set, he gets himself elected senator from Arizona, that's his picture of the senator. I got him up there on the horse, because though he was this rich 
kid from this retailing family. He also fancied himself a rough and tumble individual, a, a, a sort of rugged cowboy, and he liked to dress up. And this wasn't just the way he dressed, this was his political ideology. His political ideology said, the man we should respect is the rugged individual, the man who takes care of himself, not the man who goes crying to government for help. Right? This, was, this was an ideology of rugged individual that insulted people who needed help by saying that somehow uh, they were weak and couldn't take care of themselves, that we really wanted to celebrate the cowboy, the rugged individual. Now this works if you're rich. Because if you're rich, you don't need help from anybody else, even if things go badly. Right? It also works uh, uh, for a lot of people who are very young. Right? A lot of people who are young, some of you all, you imagine greater triumphs than you'll in fact experience. You don't anticipate hardships you're likely to encounter. And it's possible to imagine when you're 18, when you're 20, that you're going to make it on your own and won't need help from anybody else and nobody else is going to need help from you. right? And you know who else this really appeals to, by the way? The high-tech kids in Silicon Valley who are young and rich. right? And so you've heard about sort of libertarianism. The minimal government, everybody on their own, rugged individual, that's real popular in Silicon Valley. They're young, they're rich. That's not reality. It's not reality for the rest of us. The rest of us, we need to be in this together. And if we succeed, great, then we help others. But when we fail, we need others to help us, right? Okay, Barry Goldwater, he's going to run as an opponent of the New Deal. But he knows the New Deal is popular. So he's got a strategy. How's he going to win votes? This is the only text I'm going to show you. I actually kind of usually hate PowerPoint because it's so much text and words and blah, blah. This is the only text I'm going to put up here. This is a, Republican na uh, a meeting of the Republican National Committee. Civil rights movement is gathering steam in the early 1960s. White anxiety is rising. And the Republican Committee says, that there is substantial political gold to be mined in the racial crisis by becoming, in fact, though not in name, the white man's party. Now, if there is a white man's party in 1963, it's the Southern Democrats. This isn't a story about prejudice in the Republican Party. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party in this era are about equally, if tepidly, committed to civil rights. This is not about latent racism in the Republican Party. If there's a white man's party in this era, it's, it's the Southern Democrats who've been using violence, who've been using coercion, who've been using uh, a literacy test, uh, every trick in the book to keep blacks from voting. Right? But this is a strategic decision on the part of the Republican Party to start using racial appeals to begin winning votes. And they understand that the language of white supremacy is no longer acceptable. That that's been one of the successes of the civil rights movement. So how are you going to appeal for racial votes if you don't explicitly use the language of race? You shift to dog whistles. And what were the dog whistles that Barry Goldwater used? He used two. One was freedom of association. We all get to, be, we all get to associate with whoever we like. Sounds neutral. Except that everyone understood at the time freedom of association meant the right of white business owners to exclude African Americans. Or the right of white property owners to refuse to sell or to rent to African Americans. So that was one, freedom of association. The other was states' rights. States' rights. Who can object to that? It sounds so abstract. I mean, even in my con law class, students' eyes glaze over federalism, state, state federal relations. It's boring. Except that everyone knew states' rights meant the right of southern states to resist Brown versus Board of Education and the federal requirement that they desegregate their schools. So when Barry Goldwater says states' rights, people hear resistance to integration. When he says freedom of association, people hear the right to resist integration. Right? These are the coded terms he uses. How did he do? He was crushed. He lost. In 1964, Barry Goldwater is running against Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson is campaigning, saying he's going to expand the New Deal. He's going to create a war on poverty. 
he's going, he's vowing to eliminate poverty. And Lyndon Johnson crushes, crushes Barry Goldwater. And many people come to understand 1964 as the year in which the New Deal fully consolidated its hold on the American poli uh, polity. And people really believed in New Deal intervention. We really believed we could eliminate poverty. Right? Except there's a warning rising in the South. Right? Now, the one out, that, that's Arizona, voted for their senator. Otherwise, you see five deep South states. Those are the five states with the largest African-American populations. Now, this is a shock. Right? Why? In the Deep South, more even than in the North, they were committed to the New Deal because the South was hit harder by the Depression and was less industrialized to begin with. So the South, they loved the New Deal. And also in the South, they hate Republicans. They hated them. Why did they hate Republicans? Well, it was the Republican Lincoln who launched the war of aggression against the South. And it was the Republican Dwight Eisenhower who first ordered federal troops into the South in Cooper River in Cooper to enforce the federal desegregation remedy, right? So the, the South, they have vowed for generations never to vote for Republican. And here you see Southerners who love the New Deal and who hate Republicans voting for a Republican who promises to dismantle the New Deal. And why is this a warning? Because it says, if you appeal to whites in racial terms, even the most die-hard New Dealers, even the most fervent Democrats can be convinced to switch and vote for a Republican who plans to dismantle the New Deal. And that's the warning. Would it, plan out, would it play out? Tricky Dick Nixon. Right, 1968. Nixon is a, is a moderate Republican. He's not in the sort of hostile to the New Deal mode of Barry Goldwater. And it's not clear by 1968 that these sort of coded racial appeals are the way to win, at least not early in the campaign. Later in the campaign, it begins to seem, it begins to emerge for Nixon that he does have to switch to racial appeals. Not clear, he barely wins in 68 by 69. Number crunchers have run numbers, demographers, the pundits, and they said, yes, it's possible. A title change can occur. The New Deal coalition of blacks, northeastern elites, and the white working class can be broken if you switch to racial appeals. And Nixon, as a Republican, when he runs for re-election in 1972, does so primarily on the strength of racial appeals. He says he's going to slow school integration in the South. He says he's going to enforce law and order, uh, creating this the, 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 the start of this uh, uh, sort of policy equivalence between African Americans and crime. Law and order is a coded word to talk about fear of crime uh, in racialized terms. Um, uh, he's against what he calls forced busing. Forced busing, that is to say, putting children on buses to integrate schools in the North, right? As if the issue is putting people on, uh, putting kids on buses, kids with run on buses for the entire century. Point was forced busing was a way to oppose integration. Those are the terms that Nixon runs on. This is 1972. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson, promising to expand the New Deal and to launch a war on poverty, carried 67% of the white vote. In 1972, Richard Nixon, promising to slow integration uh, and to oppose forced busing, carried 70% of the white vote. And this is the title shift that we're living with now. But that's only half the story. That's the story that says coded racial appeals can be used to win votes, to create anxiety and to win votes. The other half of the story is how these same coded racial appeals can be used to turn people against good government. And that story really requires Ronald Reagan. So this is Ronald Reagan. He's just won the nomination to be the Republican candidate for president in 1980. This is his first campaign stop. It's the first official campaign stop. It's in Neshoba County, Mississippi, which is infamous because 16 years earlier, three civil rights workers there had been kidnapped, lynched, their bodies not found for a couple months. 
there wasn't a voter alive in 1980 in Neshoba County when Reagan shows up there who hadn't been alive in 1964 when these three young men were kidnapped and killed. And Reagan goes to Neshoba County and what does he promise? States' rights. He uses Barry Goldwater's language to say that he's in favor of states' rights. And everyone understands states' rights is the right of whites to resist integration. Okay, what else does Reagan do? He begins to tell stories on the campaign trail. Maybe you've heard of him. He begins to talk about welfare queen. I want to tell you another story that he begins to tell. He begins to look out at his audiences and he begins to say, I understand your frustration. When you're in the grocery store and you're waiting in line to buy hamburger and some young fellow ahead of you is buying a T-bone steak with food stamps. Now the first time he told that story, he didn't say some young fellow. He said <coughs> some young buck. Right? A southern term for a strong black man, typically one who resists white authority or who lusts after white women. He says, I understand your frustration when you're in line to buy a T-bone, buy hamburger, and some young buck is ahead of you waiting to buy a T-bone steak with food stamps. There's the racial imagery. The racial imagery isn't just of lazy African Americans. It's of strong, young African Americans who could work. They could support themselves, but they choose not to. They prefer to rip off the system rather than work, right? That's the racial imagery of the young buck. Now, he was criticized for using that language, so he changed it. He started saying some young fellow, but kept telling the story. He forgot the point. That's the imagery of the African American. There's also an imagery of the white person in this story, the you, right? And the you is implicitly a white person who works hard, plays by the rules, is struggling to get by, you're buying hamburger, right? and somebody else is ripping off the system. That's the you, okay? There's a third character here, and probably the most malevolent character. It's government, because it's government that's reaching its hands into the pocket of the hardworking white, taking that person's money and giving it to the undeserving, lazy, scheming African-American. He's telling that story. And what does he say <coughs> to voters? He says, we need to defund government. We need tax cuts. And he gets them. Reagan gets tax cuts. For the middle class, for the working class? No. The Reagan tax cuts that are enacted starting in 1980, that decade transfer a, a trillion dollars in wealth to the top 1% of the country. And the, and the massive inequality that we have seen starts, more or less, in 1980. In part through these massive tax cuts that are transferring ever greater <coughs> amounts to the very wealthy while continuing a high tax burden on the poor. And by the way, just, sorry, let me throw this in. Ferguson, Missouri. We've cut taxes on the rich. We've cut taxes on property holders. Governments have to fund themselves. How do governments fund themselves? They fund themselves in part through traffic stops, through fines, through court fees, right? So if you paid attention to Ferguson, Missouri, you probably read some of the articles saying, look, some of the municipalities around St. Louis are getting half their revenue, 50, 70% of their revenue are coming from traffic fines, speeding fines, court costs. What are those? Those are taxes on the poor. We've cut taxes on the rich. Government still needs to operate. Where is it going to get money? From the poor, right? This starts uh, with, with Reagan. Willie Horton. Maybe you've heard of the Willie Horton Act. So um, Reagan presides over deregulation of the economy. He presides over these massive tax cuts for the very rich. He presides over a tax on unions. And the result late in his administration is um, uh, a collapse of the savings and loan industry because of massive fraud that leads to a slowdown in the economy. The economy is stagnant. And Reagan's vice president, George W. Bush, or George H. W. Bush, is in trouble in 1988. He's in trouble because the economy is in such terrible shape. Till he turns to this ad. Right? This is a dog whistle in the sense that 
this ad never mentioned race, but it used the photo to tell the story of uh, an African American who uh, was on furlough and escaped. Um, uh, and this was in the home state of Bush's um, uh, opponent to caucus. When Bush runs this ad, within one month, 12% of the electorate switches sides. Right? And this ad is credited with electing George H.W. Bush, who then continued Reagan's policies for another four years. But all of this may seem like distant history. How, do dog, how does dog whistling work now? So I want to say that dog whistling coming out of the South, coming out of the 60s and the 70s, really starts with a focus on African Americans and a demonization of African Americans. They're welfare chiefs, they're thugs, they're criminals. But after 9-11, the language evolves in momentous ways. One of the ways it evolves is in terms of the creation of the specter of a terrorist who's a threat not on some distant shore, but in America's heartland. And so this is, so this is Topeka, Kansas. We're one step closer to Burka than you would think. This is Kansas, which passed a law that its state courts cannot draw on uh, Muslim uh, religious law, cannot draw on Sharia law. Was that likely? Was that imminent? Or were they, you know, the Kansas judges were itching to make, base their decisions on Sharia? That's absurd. Except that the frame builds on the idea that there's an enemy within, a brown enemy within. And we can talk about this enemy in the language of terrorism, uh, in the language of religion, but underlying that, is a sort of a, a racial anxiety about these brown threatening others. And if you want to sort of understand the racial element of it, think of the face of Osama bin Laden. That face has become synonymous with a new racial specter, which is constantly invoked. In fact, if you've been paying attention, um, uh, the House and Governor Rick Perry in Texas and several uh, 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 Republican representatives in the House have been claiming that ISIS is about to penetrate the southern border and launch car bomb attacks, right? That, that, that we're under immediate imminent threat. And speaking of the southern border, there has long been a sort of a racial hysteria surrounding Latinos. We have mass deportation campaigns during the Great Depression. We have mass deportation campaign, not so subtly named Operation Wetback uh, in the early 1950s. But what happens after 9-11 is that the idea of a terrorist threat through the southern border um, gets generalized into this idea that Latino immigrants, undocumented immigrants, are a threat to the security of the country. Right? And what had been regional, this is definitely, we have a long history of this in California, but what had been regional suddenly becomes national in scope. Look at the way this is framed. USA, keep out. You've got undocumented immigrants pouring in. It's the southern border. It's not the northern border. We're not worried about Canadians. In fact, again, just an aside, um, I have two uh, brothers-in-law. Um, one of them was dating an undocumented woman from Canada. One, an undocumented woman from Mexico. The one who was dating the blonde, blue-eyed Canadian. Back and forth, in and out of the country all the time. Never a problem. The one who was dating an undocumented woman from Mexico, they, couldn't, they didn't dare drive south of L.A. Right? We say undocumented, we don't mean just anybody, we mean Latinos. But look also, so it's not just that, that there's these threatening people who are pouring across the border, look at the role of government. It's there to provide free education, free jobs, free health care. It's liberal government that's the problem, that's enticing and pandering to these undeserving invaders, right? And free lemonade, by the way, if you're thirsty. 2012, Mitt Romney. Did he use coded racial appeals? Obama isn't working, the lazy black man, I don't know, maybe it's just me, I don't know. I'm going to show you an ad. This isn't just any ad. Mitt Romney is going to spend half his campaign budget on this ad in the summer of 2012. Half his campaign budget. In 1996, President Clinton and a bipartisan Congress helped end welfare as we know it by requiring work for welfare. But on July 12th, President Obama quietly announced a plan to gut welfare reform by dropping work requirements under Obama's
this plan, you wouldn't have to work and wouldn't have to train for a job. They just send you your welfare check. And welfare to work goes back to being plain old welfare. Mitt Romney will restore the work requirement because it works. I'm Mitt Romney and I approve this message. Half his campaign budget on this ad. Now the thing about the ad is the underlying claim was false. Obama didn't make those changes to the welfare to welfare laws. In fact, Politifax rated this ad pants on fire. Right? It was just a lie. It was just false. And this is when a Romney campaign spokesperson responds to Politifax by saying, "We won't let our campaign be dictated by the facts." <laughs> no, why would you? That's crazy, right? Because you're running a campaign based on fear. Why? Why would you pay attention to fact, right? Okay, so so this is Romney spending half his campaign budget to try and tie Obama falsely to welfare. That's pure dog whistling. I'm going to show you another clip. Um, uh, this is the 47 percent comment that Romney makes. Right now, he's talking about half the country. And as you listen to this, I want to I want you to ask yourself: Is this dog whistling? He's talking about half the country. Is this dog whistling? There are 47 percent of the people who vote for the president are not white. All right, there are 47 percent who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. And, and, I mean, the president starts off with 48, 49, 48. He starts off with a huge number. Uh, these are people who pay no income tax. 47% of Americans pay no income tax. So our message of low taxes doesn't connect. And he'll be out there talking about tax cuts for the rich. I mean, that's what they celebrate every four years. And, uh, and so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. What I have to do is convince the 5 to 10% in the center that are independent, that are thoughtful, that look at voting one way or the other, depending upon, in some cases, emotion, whether they like the guy or not. Okay, so this is Mitt Romney. It can't be dog whistle politics, because he's talking about half the country. So he's not demonizing minorities anymore. But listen to the language. He's saying these are people who refuse to take responsibility for themselves, who refuse to take care of themselves, who have an entitlement mentality. And by the way, what do they what do you think they what do they think they're entitled to? Food, housing, health care. Yeah, yeah, they're ripping us off. Right. I mean, but 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 so he's saying lack of responsibility, entitlement mentality, won't take care of themselves. This is the language that politicians have been using to denigrate minorities. Except now it's being transferred to half the country, right? to half the country. And think about, I mean, just, just sorry, you got to think about this. Great Recession in 2008. Romney comes out, he's campaigning in 2012. What does he promise to do? He says in the midst of the sort of um, uh, fraud and collapse in the financial industry, he promises to deregulate the economy. In the midst of um, a recovery which has completely stalled for the middle and working class, he promises to end government assistance. In the midst of a surging recovery for the top 1%, you all understand that 97% of the recovery since 2008 has gone to the top 1%. I mean, we recovered if the we is the top 1%. We're doing great. And in the midst of that, what does he promise? To cut taxes for the rich. And of the 47%, he says, my job is not to care for those people. This is a person who wants to be president. And he says, I don't need to care for half the country. That is cruel. It's inhumane to say to people who are suffering, you're just needy and refuse to take responsibility when you want health care, food, shelter. That's just cruel. Right? This is Barry Goldwater on steroids. And the question is, how did Mitt Romney do? Right? He lost. Okay. And, uh, you know, I mean, thank God. <laughs> <laughs>
This is Nixon in 1972, running on, on dog whistle appeals. How did Romney do, not among all voters, but among whites? Mitt Romney won three out of five white voters. Now, some people say, well, he won among old white men. He did. And he won among white women. And he won among young whites as well. Right? Every cohort of the white electorate, including the youngest, ages 18 to 25, voted a majority for Mitt Romney. And this isn't just the South anymore, all across the country. This is the politics that we confront today, a politics in which one political party has embraced a, a narrative that says the real problem in our lives is a liberal government that coddles undeserving scheming minorities. Vote against that liberal government. Go ahead and don't worry about a government that gives increasing power to the very rich. Don't worry about a market rigged for the very rich. Don't worry about surging wealth inequality. Worry about undocumented immigrants crossing the, the, the Texas border. Worry about African Americans on welfare. Right? This is what one party is saying. And it's working within a significant, within a majority of the white population. So I'm going to close by, by uh, uh, three quick things that we need to do. One, we need to remember that we know how to get, we know how to create a vibrant and expanding middle class. We need good government, government that works for everybody, not government that rigs the system for the very rich. We know also that when we embrace these sort of good government proposals, we will be met not with direct attacks on good government, but instead with insinuations about how liberalism is really just in the service of minorities. And so that means that not only do we need to start talking about good government, but we need to start talking about race. We need to start identifying dog whistling, calling it out for what it is, and repudiating it. Saying we will not be divided anymore by racial uh, 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 rhetoric. Third, we need to work inside but also outside of both political parties. It's not that the Democrats have got this right. In fact, the Democrats have engaged often in their own sort of dog whistling. Um, I didn't talk about it too much, but that's why Mitt Romney's ad celebrates Bill Clinton. How does Bill Clinton win the White House? He, he wins the White House by, by coming very close to winning the majority of the white vote. And how does he do that? By promising to end welfare as a way of life. Right? That is, Bill Clinton engages in his own dog whistling. We need to work inside and outside of both political parties. Partly because so much money has been has corrupted both of them. Partly because both have seen the benefits of dog whistling. Mainly because so much political and economic power has now been transferred away from us and to the very rich. And we won't get our political parties back simply by working within them. We need to work also outside of them. All right, I'll stop there and happy to take questions or arguments or whatever. <coughs> Please. Um, so in, in, in addressing this, uh, it seems like there has been, especially in recent years, I mean, I guess there's been for a long time a backlash to integration to what's been happening. Sweet. Look at Clyde and Bundy. Oh, what happened he's perfect. Them. So, so, you know, um, so I'm half white, 
um, um, Latino, white. My dad's family is from Eastern Washington, working class family. Um, um, so I, what's happening with a lot of whites? What's happening with a lot of whites is what's happening with a lot of the country. People are working hard. Um, uh, people are having a hard time making ends meet. Wages have stagnated. Good jobs have been shipped overseas. Uh, home equity has gone through the floor, um, and it's not coming back. And we're we're seeing people, whites and non-whites, really worried about what's going to happen with their children. People need a story. They need a way to understand what happened. What happened in my life, right? And the question is, who's providing the story? And what the right has done is it's provided a coherent story that said, hey, you know what happened in your life? Government turned against you. Government started giving all these handouts to minorities. Government doesn't take care of you anymore. You should hate the federal government because the real problem in your life is the federal government and all of these minorities. And so Clive and Bundy, I mean, he's a perfect example. Here he is. He's a rancher out in Nevada. He's ripping off the federal government by grazing his land on public land. Um, um, he responds with force to federal enforcement efforts, but then he gives these sort of freewheeling speeches in which he talks about uh, the Negro in public housing and how the Negro might in fact have been better off under slavery because then they had some work to do, right? And it's this, you're, it's kind of like this is crazy except that it's a perfect encapsulation of right-wing ideology, it, it, which says, you want to understand what's wrong in your life? What's wrong in your life is a federal government um, uh, that is pandering to minorities. We, you know, I, I am really happy to castigate in the strongest possible terms people like Barry Goldwater, even people like Bill Clinton, people like Mitt Romney. I, I call them in my book strategic racists. They are racists. They know what they're doing with this language. They don't do it out of hatred. They do it out of strategy. They do it to win power, to win votes. They are strategic racists. We should blame them in the most forceful terms. But Tea Partiers, for example, grassroots folks, people who are voting Republican because they're afraid, I'm not interested in blaming them. I'm interested in saying to them, hey, you do have big problems in your life. There are crises in your life. But the solution isn't to fear the federal government and to demonize minorities. The solution is to demand that government help everybody. Right. So, so it's, I don't think, come back to your question more centrally, this is not a story fundamentally about racism. This is a story about how racism is being used as a weapon in a battle that's really about who this country is for, right? And one side is using race to say, hey, this country's really for white people. Though, in fact, what they're doing is they're transferring all the power up to the very rich. And I think it's incumbent on the rest of us to say, no, this, this country is for all of us. And for it to be for all of us, we need to understand that the very rich can be quite dangerous to all of us. And that one of the ways they're dangerous is they're going to try and convince us that race is the biggest divider in our society, rather than the sort of power that some people hold and wield over the rest of us. There's somebody from this side. Than, you know, the majority of the population because they can like help fund like political parties and campaigns. No kidding. Right? So, how do we, you know, so what do we have? We have numbers. We have solidarity. We have community. So and I and I and I don't think look, social transformation comes through social mobilization. Social mobilization it, it takes uh, an awful lot of work, an awful lot of, of, of making connections. It takes the right frame. We need a story to say to people, hey, join us. The problem in, in our lives are the very rich, not uh, uh, racial divisions. Join us. We can understand what has happened and we can see a way forward. Right? You need the right frame. You need that, you need that work. You need that energy. Um, but I look at like the, the Occupy movement. Um, uh, I look at all of the energy of the Occupy movement generated. I look at all of the energy that was poured into Obama's campaign in 2008, right? When he, when he was talking about change we can believe in 
and when many people thought we really were going to change. Right? I look at the energy in Ferguson. Right? I think there's a tremendous pent up sense of frustration that things have gone awry in this country. And I think people are ready to mobilize, are ready to reach out, ready to connect with each other. And that's all we have. But we have to do that. We can't sit back and say, um, OK, this is only going to happen through established channels. Because I think you're right. The established channels are already sort of co-opted in a way that serves the very rich. Now, let me just add one more thing. I think at the same time, we shouldn't abandon established channels. Right? We need to work also within the parties. And this, I think, was one of the mistakes that the Occupy movement made, that they, that they wanted to be anarchic in the sense of not having a policy program and not working with an established institution. You can't, change doesn't happen that way. I mean, you know, you, you need people working in parallel, in the streets and in the suite. And you got you to gotta do them both. Or it's not going to be both, there's going to be lots, but you got to do all of it. Okay. Others? Um, well, there's there's that, and then, well, look, what happens with prisons is that politicians need a language that, that to mobilize white anxiety, so they begin to talk about crime. It's not enough to talk about crime, pretty soon you got to do something about it. <coughs> Democrats pretty quickly figure out that they're losing votes to these appeal to crime, so they start to talk about crime, too. And what happens is you get a sort of an upward bidding war between Republicans and Democrats to show who can be the toughest on crime. And the result of that is mass incarceration. So if you haven't read a Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, you should read The New Jim Crow. It really describes this process, right? The New Jim Crow is one facet of the way in which dog whistle politics um, doesn't stay on the campaign trail. It's turned into policy, and when it's turned into policy, um, it's bad for the whole country, but it's incredibly brutal for communities of color. And so I would put mass incarceration, I would put also mass deportation. Obama, right now, is deporting more people per year than George Bush ever did. Right? This is the, this is the highest level of sustained deportations this country has ever endured. Why? because he's worried about looking soft on brown people, right? And so it turned into policy is incredibly crushing what this does. Is mass incarceration first and foremost about making money? Not, not directly, um, but once you institutionalize it, the opportunities to make money are there. So what happens? Once you institutionalize it, you get the correctional officers uh, union which then has a large stake in continuing high levels of incarceration, right? And so they become one of the biggest donors in California politics, or, or, or prison guards unions. Right? Another thing that happens is you get the Correctional Corporation of America. You get private prisons. And these private prisons, they build all these prisons. They're making money off of prisons. And they're lobbying Congress to imprison more people. And Congress responds by saying, well, we need more prisoners. Who should we imprison? Let, let's imprison people who are deportable, so, so previously in our under immigration system, you ruled deportable, you're released, but you're subject to deportation. Now Congress says, no, you have to go to jail. Why? Because they got to fill the bed with the cor uh, Correction Corporation of America. People are making money off of this, and, and it makes it harder to dismantle. But I'm not telling a crude story in which every policy is directly connected to the pocketbooks of the rich. I'm saying... The narrative, the ideology that says fear minorities is directly connected to an ideology that says uh, uh, federal government and minorities are the problem, don't worry about the very rich. That ideology invariably turns into concrete policies, and those concrete policies are enormously damaging. I think we've got, but time, well, really close. Time, time for one quick question. I just had a question on kind of what you see for the future because you mentioned that government's the backbone to creating a middle class against a strong middle class. But since the government and Congress has been so divided more than it almost has ever been in our history, and in order to get anything done, you need bipartisan um, agreement on yeah. issues. Do you see anything like that happening in the future? Because the past eight years or so has been a total opposite. Yeah, no. Uh, um, 
um, yes, I do. Uh, yes, I'm optimistic. I'm op I'm optimistic in the sense that there's partly because there's demographic change, but 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 not primarily. I'm primarily optimistic because I and this is sort of come back to this previous conversation. I'm primarily optimistic because I think I don't know. You'd have to turn to each other and ask yourselves, but I have a sense that most of you understand something's gone wrong in our country and that that government really should be for everybody and that it's going to be a lot of hard work to bring government back on the side of most people and that the very rich, hey, they're probably decent people, but when they want to try and run government, run the economy for themselves, that's dangerous for the rest of us, right? And if you all have that sense, then that's the source of change and then that's the reason to be optimistic. If you have that sense, and also you're willing to work hard to make that change. Thank you all. Thank you.